Thank you so much. Um, hello and welcome uh, everybody to this very first edition of Face Off, JMF's new live snap debate featuring one question and two opinions in 30 minutes. Um, um, I'm Christina Kausch, Senior Fellow at GMF, and today we're going to talk about uh, Europe's role in Libya. It's been nine years since, Na since the NATO intervention that toppled Gaddafi, and the analysts, analysts evaluate Europe's role in the Libyan civil war that followed as ranging between uh, counterproductive and disastrous. Since 2015, the EU was form has been formally supporting the Tripoli-based government of National Court, or GNA. But the EU was barely visible on the ground, while EU member states, France and Italy, uh, both prioritizing their respective uh, economic and security vested interests, were supporting opposing factions and ultimately helped to fuel the conflict and undermine the very UN process they were formally backing. Since Haftar's march on Tripoli in April 2019, the conflict has further escalated. European inertia and divisions have facilitated the entry of, uh, of Turkish troops in Libya uh, in January this year, with Turkey now siding with the GNA in the country's west against the Russia, UAE, Egypt-backed uh, troops led by General Haftar in the country's east. Now Europeans fear that the situation in Libya could morph into a frozen conflict with the country split um, um, in spheres of influence between its main backers, main foreign backers, and thereby entrenching uh, both Russian and Turkish influence uh, in the southern Mediterranean at the EU's immediate doorstep. Now, such European concerns of further geopol geopolitical marginalization are uh, well founded as the developments in Libya seem to follow a, a pattern of Russia and regional powers filling security vacuum, vacuums in the neighborhood um, and sorting out conflicts amongst each other in ways that are detrimental to European interests, while Europe stands idly by. So Europe sidelined itself by inaction and division. What will and can the EU still do to turn things around? Now, voices have grown louder in Europe, including from EU High Representative uh, Joseph Borrell, um, demanding a debate on a possible deployment of EU troops in Libya, either under a UN or EU roof to monitor a potential ceasefire, for example. Now, much of this debate in Europe centers on Europe's geopolitical maturity in its neighborhood. But how about the fate of Libya itself? The outlook of a stable, united and self-governed Libya is bleak. How exactly would European boots on the ground contribute to a lasting stabilization um, of the country? Many Libyans will tell you the la that the last thing they need are more foreign troops. So is this what Libyans want and need, or is it what Europe needs to boost its geopolitical profile in the neighborhood? And this leads us to our question, does Libya need European boots on the ground? Yes says Natalie, well, hang on with the poll, just a second. Yes, says Natalie Tocci, uh, director, director of the Italian Institute of Foreign Affairs and advisor to EU High Representative uh, Josep Borrell. Thank you for being with us, Natalie. Um, no, says Franziska Brandner, member of the German Bundestag for Bündnis Neusig die Grüne, the German Green German Party, and the group's spokesperson for European policy. Hello, Franziska, thank you both. Welcome and uh, thank you for joining us. Now, before I give you both a floor um, to present your arguments, let's have a look at what the audience thinks. So you'll see the pop-up. Can we have the pop-up back with the poll? Will you see a pop-up? And so please vote now. What's your opinion? Does Libya need European boots on the ground? Yes or no? Um, while we're waiting, so you cast your vote. Um, I forgot to mention you also, of course, welcome to the debate. Will you take the hashtag face off? Um, and I would in particular encourage our Libyan viewers to have their say and let us know what the EU should or should not do via Twitter. Okay, um, the poll, let's say five, well, it's already gone. Five, four, three, two, one, there it is. Okay, so this is what our audience thinks. Interesting, 41% say yes, uh, Libya needs European boots on the ground and 59 think 
that it does not. Um, we'll repeat the poll at the end of this debate. Uh, and I will now give Natalie and Francisca a chance to argue their case. Five minutes are allotted to each speaker. Time will be stopped by an audio signal, which sounds like this. <laughs> you hear anything? It doesn't sound like anything. You hear any bell? Elizabeth, you're muted. Where's our audio signal? Hmm. There we are, good. So Natalie and Francisca, you hear this, uh, this bell, your time is up, okay? Um, does Libya need European boots on the ground? Natalie, your case. Okay, so first let's make sure we understand what the question is. And the question is, does Libya need a European military intervention? No, that's not the question. The question is, does uh, Libya need European boots on the ground? And I think in order to unpack this question, let me begin by answering another question, which is, does Libya need a European presence? And does Europe need a presence in Libya uh, on the ground? And I would say that the answer to that first question is definitely a yes. Why? Well, it's very clear that the situation in Libya is a huge concern uh, to Europe uh, and to the European Union. Uh, it is a question of human security, it is a question of migration, it is a question of energy, it is a question of hard security. Whichever way we unpack the question, it is clear that both A, a war in Libya, and B, uh, or a throne of Libya uh, are not in either Libya or the European Union's interest. And it is clear that if there is not a European presence, uh, there is either, and of course other regional actors are present, uh, the result on the ground is either a war, this is obviously the direction that some regional players have been pushing in, UAE, Egypt, or there is a sizzling or a frozen conflict, which is of course the direction that Turkey uh, and uh, Russia have been uh, pushing into. And neither of these two options are in the European interest. So if we do have an interest in having a presence in Libya, then the question is what kind of presence? So uh, option number one, do we need to have an air presence? And here my answer is definitely no. We do not need to have a repeat of the 2011 air operation. This is not the kind of military intervention that Europeans either have the capability or they have the willingness to do. And I would argue that this is definitely not in the interest either of Europe or of Libya itself. Do we need to have a sea presence? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we already are present at sea. And should we be present at sea? My argument is that no, we should not be only present at sea. We're present at sea through Operation Irini in order to enforce an arms embargo. However, we know full well that arms in Libya do not only reach by sea. They reach by air, they reach by land. Uh, and there are, there's only one party's uh, weapons which reach by sea, which is, of course, Turkey, which means that not only a presence by sea is an incomplete presence, but it also ends up being a one-sided presence. Now, this leaves the third option, which is land, and boots normally step on land, which is why I do think that we need to have a land presence in, uh, in Libya. Now, what kind of land presence are we talking about? We're basically talking about a, a civilian presence, uh, in order to monitor whether this is a comprehensive ceasefire uh, or whether this is a uh, more limited set of local ceasefires, you need to monitor such a ceasefire when and if we eventually reach it. So I definitely do think that this is something that Europeans should be involved in. I also think that given that the situation, the security situation in Libya will continue pre predictably to be quite dangerous, they need to be a civilian presence and therefore force protection do entail also military boots on the ground in order to militarily protect uh, a civilian monetary mission. In addition to this, uh, other forms of land military presence could entail the support of the security sector, particularly beginning in Western Libya and then of course eventually extending to the rest of the country too. Uh, final thing that I wanted to say, if we are to be present and we are to have also a security presence in Libya, should this security presence in Libya um, uh, take place on our own? I think no, it should not. I think that indeed, as uh, Josep Borrell himself hinted at, this is a security presence that should take place in the context of the United Nations, uh, in partnership with the African Union, with the League of Arab States, 
the more the merrier. So it is not something that Europeans should do alone. They should try and involve as much as possible other regional and global players. But it should be, as I said, a land presence in Syria because the conflict in Syria takes place on land. And if we want to secure not only a, uh, we want to make sure that a, a, a ceasefire when it is eventually reached is not a ceasefire that is uh, in the same uh, way as other frozen conflicts in Eastern Europe. Uh, and this is, of course, you know, part of the strategy that Russia knows how to play very well. We need to make sure that a ceasefire in Libya, when it is reached, is actually steered towards reconciliation and peace, peace building. And we can not only wish it to go in this direction, we need to make sure that we do something uh, to ensure that it happens. Uh, hence, the, the, the reason why I would support uh, a, a, a sort of European boots on the ground in this particular way, uh, is this risky? Yes, it is risky. Uh, but ultimately, if we want to protect and promote our interests, these are simply risks that we will take, because unless we take those risks, uh, others will take them for us. And the way they will take those risks, uh, I would argue, would be neither in Libya's interest nor in Europe's interest as well. And I'll stop there. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Yeah, well done. <laughs> um, does Libya need European boots on the ground? No. Francisca, you have the floor. Yes, I think I'm stopped. first of all, I think we have to define what do we mean when we say Europe. Natalie, I think you talk about the EU. The problem in Libya has been that there hasn't been an EU policy towards Libya. There has been a French, an Italian, a British, most of the time an absent German one. Um, and that's the key problem in Libya is that we don't have an EU policy and we still don't have it. Um, and I think that's the main task of Europe, of the EU, is to come to terms internally and really have a common joint strategy that is more uh, than on the paper and in abstract. I think if the EU has one job, then it's to do that. Uh, and that's what we have to debate first we, before we even talk about sending troops some, somewhere. Um, second, if you want to send troops, you have to really define what you need to do or want to do in, and in what framework. Um, and so far we have no ceasefire that we could protect or support in the UN-led uh, mission. There is, you know, it would be wonderful if we could have it, but it's far from it. Uh, so first of all, if you, you cannot talk in abstract about troops, if you don't have a process that could be supported by it, and I think it's risky to speak about something that we are so far away from um, and that we need to talk about the other things first and then you can talk about this. Um, third, what's the current task of the EU? We have to enforce the arms embargo on all, and I repeat, all A double L actors. And we're not really doing this. Um, we are closing, or some European partners, particularly France, are closing their eyes on UAE, um, on Egypt, on what they're doing. And I think that's a real mistake. Uh, and that's what we need to change, that we get much more critical. Also Germany, when, it, uh, when we look at its arms export to UAE, et cetera, we're not really doing an arms embargo, which we should and are legally obliged actually to do. So if you know there are all of these things that we have to do, that we could do, that we're not doing. And I would like to remember what just came out recently, the propaganda of UAE when it comes to um, using, you know, even uh, fake personas uh, and to really run a campaign uh, against some of these actors and really putting out wrong information. These are still, you know, considered partners. Uh, we do we still deliver arms uh, and we don't spot them out. We don't sanction it. Uh, that's what the EU, uh, what we in Germany and other countries uh, should do. Another point we could and should do is stand up for human rights and the situation um, of migrants in Libya. The UN has again called to close the migration detention centers and create accountability. The EU is not doing this. Um, we're not creating legal ways. We're not, uh, you know, find, finding other solutions. We're working with them knowing that they have those detention centers. 
Um, and that's what, what really people do suffer from, and it's an untenable situation in Libya. Um, and for the point, I at least don't know any evidence of Libyans asking for EU troops to be on the ground. And I think that's a major point. I haven't heard calls from within Libya asking for the EU now to come because they would also have to say what for. And I think we need to bring Libyans into this debate because after all, this is not a test case to prove that there is a geopolitical EU. It's a test case for also if we can help Libyan citizens. And that must be the first priority in our goal. I can see the point about you know, getting into a geopolitical EU and making this sort of a test case, but we should not forget what it's all about. It's about Libyan citizens, um, and they have had enough of e in the divided EU fighting de facto in Libya. So these have been my points to start with. Thank you, boy. Uh, thank you both. Terrific. So let me, uh, now we have 10 minutes to discuss. Let's uh, pick up some of the points. Let me pick up your last point, Francesca, and throw it back to, um, to, to Natalie. So Natalie, whatever, what, how about what Libyans want? How about, so um, uh, um, Rassan Salome himself has said, who has traveled all over the country, Libyans, in Libya, there's currently no appetite for further foreign troops whatsoever. What do you reply to that? Well, I mean, I, I and I would agree with that. I mean, the question is, uh, there is no appetite for more foreign troops there to further ignite and stoke a conflict. Uh, uh, here, but we're basically talking about a sort of peace monitoring, if we get to it, and peace enforcement, uh, and security sector reform, uh, sort of mission, all of which would be sort of framed within a broader peace building mandate. Uh, and, and let's face it, there is insecurity in Libya, uh, and we cannot assume that a country which, uh, in which insecurity is rife and which is currently in a military stage of the conflict uh, can simply, uh, you know, we as Europeans, we cannot simply uh, sort of hope to contribute to the stabilization of this country by using other policy tools. Uh, of course, we have to do more. And I agree with what Francisca was saying on the migration front. One thousand percent, you know. Uh, what I'm saying is that we can't simply, A, develop strategies and uh, then sort of forget about the action. Perhaps we should remember a little bit more what we used to do at the beginning of CSDP, uh, of ESDP at the time, which was not produce lots of papers. Uh, it was actually go and do the missions. Uh, if we go back to the late 1990s, this is a lot of what we did. Now the EU has become this big, and here, you know, I admit my own faults, yeah, um, a big paper producing machine, but ultimately when it comes to the action, we shy away. And this is- right. a But, but, but as, as Francisco also pointed out earlier, uh, um, this is not for the EU, this is not an instrument for the EU's own coming of age. It is really, it should, the focus should go back to what Libyans need. I, and I, and I would agree with you. I assume, I assume that Libyans want and need reconciliation and peace building in their country. Uh, of course, what Libyans want is, is a, a massive question. I mean, if, Li if all Libyans wanted the same thing, there would not be a conflict. So obviously it is about reconciliation. And the question is, in order to achieve reconciliation and peace building, is there a security piece of that uh, recipe? And my answer to that question is yes. Francisca, um, so you said basically, before we even, there's no ceasefire, uh, before we even start talking about uh, about troops, say, hey, it needs to be a ceasefire. First, we need to get our act together ourselves in the EU and, and agree on what we actually want. So, uh, but uh, Natalie at the same time has said, uh, let me see if I get the formulation. So, if others, namely Turkey and Russia, uh, if we don't take the risk, others will. So that's the vacuum, uh, the vacuum question. What do you respond to that? Time is running away for us if we keep on discussing among ourselves, others will again jump into the vacuum and we have a situation uh, where there's more, par more parallels to Syria. So, so what do you respond to that geopolitical argument that we're being sidelined and in ways that are detriment, as I said, not only to EU interests, but certainly also to, to the interests of, Lib of Libyans after all? I totally agree that the EU needs to define a joint strategy and that it's urgently needed. Um, 
but that doesn't mean immediately sending troops. If we could really have a joint understanding that the arms embargo means no weapons into Libya from no side, and we can already survey that from the air, we can do, we are, um, it's like we have the, the seaside, we have the air. Uh, it's a political question if we really want to do it or not. And we're not there yet. We don't have that agreement. You have a Greek foreign minister who goes to meet a person who is under European sanctions for spoiling the process. Okay, that's what you have, a Greek foreign minister, not just some NGO person, the Greek foreign minister, meeting a person that is at the same time under EU sanctions and that, you know, not long ago. So that's the problem we have. And if we don't solve this, if France is doing one thing, the Greek are doing another, and then you have the Italians doing yet another thing, what mission do you want to have on the ground? What for? And I really think that instead of having this debate on, you know, it's deviating in a wrong way, our debate, we should in Europe really discuss what needs do we as Europeans need to do to get to a ceasefire? That's our job. And then so what do we need to do? What, what can you respond to that? Know, like we really need to survey that arms embargo much better. We need to find a consensus. We need to make sure there are no more Greek ministers going to meet people under sanctions. We probably have to put on a, a few more sanctions on spoilers. Uh, we probably have to talk a bit harder to some of these actors like Egypt, etc. And we probably, you know, have to be clearer in in uh, in the consequences they have to face. Do we have to stop our arms exports to UAE? These are the things we can and should do. Mm -hmm. These are tangible things. On the arms embargo, how do you how do you monitor, how do you implement the arms embargo um, by sea only? Uh, Natalie was making the point that it's not that it it, by, it becomes biased if you don't only buy Irini. It's not sea only. Irene is also not sea only. It's also in the air. By land, how do you how do you get how do you how do you stop the the arms that are coming uh, coming by land that are being shipped? You can monitor them by the, in the air and you can see it, and then you have to you know like we did now, then uh, call the shots and name them out and do sanction them those who do deliver, and that's what the EU has not yet really been doing. Is the question of what are the consequences if you stop. Um, vessels or in other ways uh, bringing arms uh, into Libya and I think that's you know if we don't do this uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense and the Berlin process you know who's still talking about the Berlin process we need a process inside Libya we it's important to bring the region in but we also need it inside Libya who's doing this where's the Berlin process going there's so many um, I think loose ends that we could bring together uh, I'll, come back, I'll come back to the Berlin, to the Berlin process in Germany so in particular in a second uh, Natalie, you've said uh, that uh, um, this, well, you just, you kind of described this whole package of which there's a civilian mission, there's a security element and so on, uh, as something that paves the way for broader peace building, which, uh, 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 which would, should be the ultimate goal. Um, you've underlined that this would not be the EU alone, but under the new um, umbrella. How realistic is it that in that this UN Security Council would give a mandate to such a uh, to such a mission, yeah? And how realistic is it that the GNA would invite the EU uh, uh, to, to come and send troops, either of them? It's not, I think that it is not unrealistic to assume that there could be a partial convergence of interest. Of course, there needs to be a, a Security Council resolution. I don't think that Russia is against a ceasefire. I don't think that the United States is against a ceasefire. I think they have very different goals. I think that the Russian idea for a ceasefire is in order to continue stoking a semi-frozen conflict in the same way as it has done in Moldova, in Georgia, in God knows where. It is part of its strategy, basically. So, but, but it does not mean that it's against a ceasefire. The point is a ceasefire can be either a stepping stone to peace or it can be a way to crystallize a frozen conflict. My point is that in order to avoid that path being taken, i.e. that of a frozen or semi-frozen conflict, there needs to be presence. There is a reason why the Berlin process is dead. And the Berlin process is dead at the moment because Europeans are not actors. And we're not actors because the, the stage of the conflict is a security stage of the conflict. We can't simply assume and hope to play a political role if we're not willing to, to, to step in and do what it takes to support what is ultimately in Libya's interest, which is reconciliation.
Okay, um, the people just interject that. So, um, so you think that 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 I mean, I don't really see how and why Russia would under in in a Security Council vote would undercut its own policies by basically you know sanctioning uh, uh, something that that would that would help push it out. You know, so but um, just to say, um, leaving vested interests aside. Do EU member states actually have the same situation assessment in Libya? Um, France, for example, right now seems to see Turkey as much more of a, of a, of a strategic threat in the region than Russia. So, Francisca, perhaps, how, how is that reconcilable, actually? How do you want to bring members, EU member states, particular France, in line? No, I was actually quite surprised, to put it politely, when Macron spoke of GNA as terrorists like the things we have refused to do in Syria, where we have saying this is a sort of a Russian technique to label those you don't like as terrorists, um, and hearing sort of the same spin there in Libya, I think it's deeply flawed and that we have nothing to win from it. And I think that that's really what we need to work on. I think there needs to be a much broader Libya debate inside many member states in France, in Germany, in other countries and that we join up uh, the debates and that we are more open about economic interests and uh, strategic interests in the region uh, because we all know what is at stake uh, and we know that the migration issue is key and and I think what would really help to bring more European unity is to call out the shots and make it a more open and honest debate. Thank you for this. Thank you both. Unfortunately time is up. Uh, there's many open questions. We've seen the geopolitical argument. We've seen the local, the Libyan side of the, uh, the argument. The, well, best to say, the local the stabilization argument. I think both both are equally valid, yet I'm not sure they are fully compatible. Now we're going to repeat the poll that we've done before. Um, does uh, Libya need European boots on the ground? Now, plus, I would please ask the audience to vote again, and then we can uh, see if you have managed to convince anybody. Uh, while we wait, um, uh, let me say that GMF face-off face -off will return after the summer break on a monthly basis. Um, so stay tuned. Five, four, three, two, one, Paul is off. Let's see. Okay, so <laughs> now we have 84 for yes and 52, uh, sorry, 48 yes, 52 no. And can you show us the, I can't remember the previous one, the previous results. All right. Well, Natalie, you've convinced 7%, 41 to 59. All right. Thank you both very much. Um, um, yes, I maybe also mention, we also had a held a Twitter poll in the days in the run up to this event. And um, there, I think that we had 193 votes of which 21% voted um, yes, boots on the ground, against 79% saying no. So uh, Twitter uh, cast a very clear... a lot of Libyans vote. voting there. I'm sorry? We had a lot of Libyans voting there. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> um, a big thanks to you, Francisca and Natalie, for pioneering this new series and arguing your motion so succinctly in this very short time. This is only the beginning of the debate. Um, I would also like to thank my GMF colleagues, Asad Seabad and Elizabeth Winter for kicking off this new series off the ground. Thanks to all of you, of course, um, our audience for tuning in. And um, as I said, we will return in September and until then, thank you very much and bye-bye.